Costing the global economy $5 trillion every year, fraud is big business. In the digital age, fraudsters are constantly evolving and exploiting new vulnerabilities, and staying ahead and protecting your business can feel like an insurmountable challenge. That's why we founded the Fraud Lab, to deconstruct attacks, mimic behaviors, and share insights with our partners. In this podcast, I'll be talking with business leaders and policymakers about their experience, the fraud landscape, and what's coming next. I'm your host, Simon Horswell. Welcome inside the Fraud Lab. In this episode, I'm joined by Mike Spears, Customer Director at Faculty, an AI consultancy founded in 2014, where Mike is transforming defense and national security capabilities through AI. Mike has extensive experience working on high profile and complex projects in the UK government and the private sector. In this conversation, we dive into deep fakes, disinformation and the necessary response to both. But first, a word from our sponsor. Inside the Fraud Lab is brought to you by Onfido. Onfido's real identity platform is trusted by thousands of businesses to stop fraud and know their customers. Their AI-powered identity verification means businesses can securely and seamlessly onboard customers anytime, anywhere. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Simon Horswell. Mike, thank you for being with us today. Hi, Simon. It's great to to be here. Thank you very much for having me. So let's kick things off. Uh, I always like to try and like level the playing field if I can for anyone who's listening. So um, obviously deep fakes are uh, a big focus at the moment. Um, our real world internal data on Fido shows huge increases year on year. Um, and it's really sort of a, a very hot topic at the moment. Um, we've touched upon it in previous podcasts as a topic, but i um, if you could, uh, I would like you to unpack deep fakes for people without getting too technical. Um, take us through the different types of deep fakes uh, and maybe the different techniques that are used to create them. Perfect. Yeah, I can do that. So um, I suppose deep fakes, uh, first of all, is a catch all term that's used to describe any form of synthetic media where a person in an existing image or video is replaced with someone else's likeness. So that's kind of the top level of what a deep fake is. Um, But there are many different subcategories underneath that. So you can look at, uh, for example, face swapping, where you'll replace one person's face with another person's face. Um, So they could be still acting the same uh, manner. You can replace them on images as well. Um, You can look at lip syncing. So you can alter the lip movements of a person in a video to match uh, a different audio track. And so you can have an individual saying something that they never said, but you have then manipulated and created. And you can also look at things like voice synthesis. So an audio that's creating kind of a synthetic voice, uh, which can sound like a specific person. Uh, we had an example like this in the UK relatively recently in the last six months, um, where there was an audio created of the um, leader of the opposition. Um, and that was produced as a voice synthesis. So it sounded like Keir Starmer, the leader of the opposition, but it was something that he never said. So there, there are a number of different examples of what a deep fake can look like, usually focused on imagery or video or, or um, audio as the main three examples. Um, and within that, there are, there are a few different techniques that can be used to help create that. I suppose one of the main techniques, um, this is where I'll get a touch more technical, but I promise I'll pull it back. I'll allow um, it. <laughs> is, a, is this technique called generative adversarial networks or GANs. Um, So essentially, these are two neural networks that work against each other. You have one which is called a generator and one which is called a discriminator. The generator creates fake images while the discriminator tries to detect them. Um, So imagine the case of of an art forger and a detective in this scenario. So an art forger is the generator. It's trying to create counterfeit paintings which look like famous paintings, whereas your discriminator is your detective. They're trying to identify these fakes. So the way that it works is that each time a forger's painting is identified as fake, that model learns from the mistakes um, and improves on the technique. And similarly, the discriminator, that that detective is also learning throughout. What are the techniques being used by um, the generator? What should we be looking for in future? 
Um, and over time, this forger and detective get better and better at their respective tasks. So they're constantly learning. And the competition continues like this until essentially the forger's paintings become so good that even that highly skilled detective finds it very challenging to tell the difference between the two. And this technique gives rise to kind of the great increase that we've seen in kind of the ability and the um, complexity of some of these models that have been created and the, the realism that we're starting to see in deepfakes out there. Right, so deepfakes in and of themselves, they're not new though, are they? I mean, they're they are very hot topic at the moment, but they've been around for years. So why is it that now they're becoming sort of so much more... Uh, so much more popular or there's so much more uh, people's lips yeah so i think i think deep fake as a term was first created back in like 2017 or so i think it was like a reddit mm -hmm. user that first used that term uh but this is just kind of a lot like the next stage in a long history of altering of media like it goes all the way back to kind of the first photo editing back in what like the late 1800s um so this is not like a it isn't something that we should be absolutely terrified of it's a new challenge that we should be looking at. Again, it's a new challenge built on the back of technology, similarly across many other aspects of, uh, of society. I suppose where we're starting to see kind of an explosion of concern around this um, is a combination of one, technological advancements, which essentially lower the technical bar to being able to create deep fakes. Um, so things like ChatGPT has enable people who are non-technical to now start to query and ask technical means of delivery. Um, there's YouTube out there where you can look up pretty much anything on how to create a deep fake. You basically need a, like a computer and a basic level of programming to be able to create these. So that's one level which I suppose is, has caused a, a dramatic increase. The, the other level is actually something that's more from society. So the media is starting to talk much more about uh, deep fakes. Um, and a lot of this focuses in around political disinformation. I think everyone will have seen kind of uh, photos of Trump being arrested. We'll also seen photos of the Pope wearing a lovely puffer jacket. Like um, these types of things raise awareness in society about uh, deep fakes, which is a good thing. But it also means that as you you raise understanding for the general public, which is great, but it also raises understanding of new methods that um, bad actors can use. Um, and that comes back round to kind of the democratization of these deep fakes and the ability of people to access them. So, yeah, now, uh, political disinformation is obviously uh, a, a very uh, well covered topic at the moment. Um, obviously, there, there's reasons why there's a lot of focus on that. We've got more elections this year around the globe than I think we've had ever uh, it's a it's a very big year for elections um but i think what's kind of overlooked quite a lot is the fact that um there is a, a corporate side of disinformation as well um and maybe it isn't as newsworthy maybe people aren't kind of like picking up on it but um what are some of the risks associated with disinformation that, that are spread about corporations that um may actually sort of be quite risky that you know perhaps people aren't that aware of Firstly, I completely agree with you. I think that um, a lot of the media focus has been around political disinformation. Um, I think there's an agenda behind that. I think um, they are looking at kind of uh, ensuring a democratic processes such as elections are, are secure. Um, so there's definitely a, a, a large push on it, and particularly when referencing kind of the biggest election year ever, of course, they're going to be looking at it. Um, I think that it's true, though, that most people are unaware that there is also a huge economic cost of disinformation. It targets corporations as well as uh, countries. Um, and interestingly, there was, a, there was a 2019 research report which looked into the economic cost of disinformation, which put it around $78 billion annually. Um, and that was five years ago. That was before we had uh, the explosion of models that can help create deepfakes, uh, before you had ChatGPT that can help guide you through the process of creating deepfake. Um, so it's it's very clear that that is a, now a much smaller number than the, the economic cost uh, today. I think what's helpful is that we're starting to see coverage of some types of corporate disinformation in the, in the mainstream media. Uh, there was a very recent case, actually, uh, the classic fraud case um, involving Arup, where a finance worker um, logged into a video call with a very sophisticated set of deepfakes on there. It was with their CFO, it was with other members of staff, 
Um, and they were convinced to send 20 million pounds to a different uh, bank account. Now that's an incredibly sophisticated deep fake scam. I think there was like, wasn't there like 15 people in the call or something? Yeah, it's incredible. Which is, yeah, that's, <laughs> wow. Yeah, uh, and they got a big payday on the back of it, but split 15 ways, probably not so much. Oh, oh I'd, I'd still be okay with it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, just saying. <laughs> um, so yeah, there's that kind of those classic fraud, almost phishing type cases, which are now being overlaid with that uh, complexity of kind of deep fake scams. Um, but there are also kind of less sophisticated on the face of it um, elements. So there was a, there's an example back in 2022 of um, a simple tweet from a, a blue tick Twitter account, um, which said that a, a US pharmaceutical company, Eli Lilly, would now be offering insulin for free. Um, and by the end of that following day, their share price had tumbled over 4%, removing billions of pounds from their stock value. And there were elements at that point of uh, shorting of the stock as well. So people have financially gained from the one tweet that was sent out. They basically paid $8 to Musk uh, to have a nice blue ticked Twitter account. Uh, and for those $8, they managed to wipe a huge significant amount off, uh, off the stock market value. It's crazy. Um, well, so, the risk of AI and disinformation, obviously this requires a response. Um, and we've been talking about it earlier and you know, we, we agreed it's a technological response, but also there needs to be a societal response as well. Um, how do you think we need to respond to the risk that some AI poses uh, with deep fakes and disinformation? So I think it's really important to maintain balance here. Um, like the AI can be used by bad actors. It can also be used in defensive capabilities. So um, I'm a firm believer that AI needs to be used in this space. Um, we can use AI to help detect um, specific synthetic media types, uh, the models that are being used to generate them. Um, and so I think that's an incredible port important part to have in our defensive capability at the detectors to be able to pick out deep fakes. And this is increasingly important because deep fakes are becoming more and more sophisticated. Uh, we are moving away from the space where you'll look at an image and you'll see someone with six fingers. That's pretty easy for someone to pick up. That kind of window of opportunity of being able to pick up on those types of really obvious tells of a synthetic um, image is starting to close out. Um, and so we need AI to be supporting us in the understanding of the ability to detect uh, these deep fakes. Um, another recent technological advancement as well is the conversations around watermarking, um, which is essentially uh, placing a watermark over the, over the top of an AI created or AI generated image uh, or audio. Um, and this is being pushed quite heavily by policymakers um, because it will support the public in understanding what's real and what's fake, what's fake, definitely. Um, but you're right to call out, this is not just a technical response. Like this is a whole of society response. If you look at actually digital literacy levels in the UK, it's pretty low. Like uh, there's a recent study which says a third of UK adults could, are unable to complete all nine tasks to remain safe online for daily life. And if you're then trying to add complexity of, can you tell whether this is a deep fake or not? If you can't even do kind of the, what are considered the most essential tasks. Like it's a pretty tough jump. Um, so there's more that we should be doing to raise digital literacy awareness. Um, a couple of countries which are really good at this, Taiwan and Finland are incredibly good at this. They introduced digital literacy right down at primary school level. Um, right. So there is, there is something that needs kind of a whole of society drive, both education, but also having kind of fact checkers, fact checking groups who can debunk these types of deep fakes or disinformation before it really starts to spread. Yeah, well, I mean, this, this the, the the idea of watermarking, again, I think kind of some of the conversations I've had with people, watermarking is a great idea in theory, but when you really drill down into it, the, the people that are going to commit fraud are going to find a way around watermarking. Yeah. Um, you know, the only way you're going to do it is maybe writing it into the code. So then it's a case of if you're determined enough going into that code and then just ripping that bit out. Um, mm. and then I think when we were talking about it before, you sort of suggested this idea that again, it kind of starts to build in this, uh, complacency almost of, uh, if it's fake, it will have a watermark. So if it hasn't got a watermark, I can trust it. Yeah. Um, which starts to build a full sense of security. 
I agree with you wholeheartedly. I think it, it there does have to be a big kind of awareness education piece. I like the idea of starting it earlier. Um, but at the same time, I think uh, certainly one of the things I come across when we're talking about fraud and we're talking about scams is the more vulnerable people are at both ends of that age spectrum. So, okay. yeah, starting young, great. But then we've got that older generation that aren't as technically literate. I mean, it's obviously it's improving as we all get older then, you know, um, mm. then that just naturally starts to improve by the fact that as, as you get older, that generation is more, more used to it. But um, I think some of the things we're talking about here, it's, yeah, it's it, it's very very difficult for someone who's a, a, a of an older generation maybe to sort of understand exactly what's going on. Um, I've I've seen scams where people are convinced. You know, for example, they saw a, they thought they spoke to a celebrity in a, in a video call, and they're convinced, yeah. and they won't be told otherwise. Um, but obviously, we can understand that this is clearly a result of a, a deep fake or something similar. So. Um, Training the young, great. Um, but at the same time, I think we have to try and focus on the people that are on, on the upper end of the spectrum as well. Yeah, I agree. And that's it, it is truly a whole of society approach. I think we need to learn from the fact that we haven't done this at an earlier age to start to educate mm -hmm. people. Um, but it shouldn't just be limited at that point. Obviously, uh, a lot of the work you're doing, or the majority of the work you're doing, is around um, defensive measures. So how are... How are you seeing AI improve safety on the defensive side? There are things that I can touch on. There are things I can't yeah, touch on, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> as always. As always. Yeah, don't, don't want to press anyone to tell uh, to air stuff that they shouldn't air. But um, uh, yeah, even at a high level, um, is, is there any kind of like improvements that you can see um, from, from using AI? So there definitely is. I mean, we... I work a lot with government clients and they have analysts looking at uh, disinformation. That's that's no secret. Um, I think what we are looking at here is the ability to support those analysts as effectively as possible to do their job as efficiently as possible to be able to keep up with the, the sheer volume of data um, and uh, potential for disinformation out there. So AI provides an incredibly useful uh, co-pilot human machine team, whatever you want to call it, uh, which can essentially augment the, um, the capabilities of those analysts to understand the threat from certain disinformation narratives and then understand the response that they can take. Um, and that is possible manually, uh, but it is time consuming. Um, and when we're in a incredibly digitally connected world, it's incredibly important for people to have um, the ability to analyze things at pace. So that's where AI can can come in and really support those analysts to triage the data, to understand patterns in the data that are difficult for humans to see or would be time consuming for people to see, or to start to identify deep fakes um, where there might not necessarily be other tells within that imagery to to support it. Yes, yeah, I, I, I know with with AI, with generative AI, there's a, there's also this kind of argument of the fact that um, people are going to be out of work or people are going to lose jobs. Um, but again, I, I'm I'm kind of on the the same side as as you, I think, uh, or we're on a similar kind of page. Whereas I think, um, with all of these advances that we're seeing, I see AI as a tool. Um, it can be used for good and it can be used for ill. And I think with the, the kind of things you're talking about there, there's still a human involvement in it because mm. someone needs to direct the AI or monitor the output from the AI, for example, when we're using it defensively. So there's some things that we can just make a, a rule on or the machine can uh, make a decision, but at the same time, someone has to be pointing it in the right space uh, in the first place. Yeah, I completely agree. There's a, there's a way to deliver AI responsibly, uh, which means that, you deliver it in a way which is explainable to humans. You don't want to have a scenario where something goes, data comes in at one side and output comes at the other, but you have no idea how those two are connected. Um, so faculty works very closely on how to understand, how to deliver um, solutions in a safe manner. Um, the AI Safety Summit, which happened last year, was an incredibly important step of building consensus around that as well. Um, and the AI Safety Institute, which the UK set up recently as well, is another way that we, uh, the UK government is trying to 
bring about an understanding of how to deliver these incredible technical advancements in a safe and responsible manner um, where their performance is still robust um, when it meets real world data. So I completely agree with you. Like we need to have humans in the loop on these types of discussions and these types of decisions, particularly when it is looking at incredibly important um, assessments, incredibly important decisions that a government might take on how they might respond. Um, that can't just be given over automatically to a machine. Mike, thank you so much for talking with us today. It's been um, truly fascinating stuff, really, really interesting. Um, where can listeners find you online to find out more about um, you and the work that you're doing? Uh, so you can find me on LinkedIn, uh, I'm Mike Spears on LinkedIn, uh, or you can go to faculty.ai, uh, which is the company that I work for, where you can read more about um, some of the applied AI solutions that we've delivered for clients. Thank you for joining us on this journey inside the Fraud Lab. If you'd like more insights into attack patterns and trends as we see them at Onfido, head to onfido.com or click the link in the show notes to access our annual identity fraud report. It's full of proprietary research into how fraudsters are attacking identity verification and how the world of prevention is changing. It's full of insights. For example, financial services has seen a 23% increase in fraud versus last year, and 46% of document fraud targets national ID cards. If you'd like to learn more, get your free copy by clicking the link in the show notes. Goodbye for now, and I hope you join us again next time.